fortune you have guessed. Through your faith, many people will be blessed. Sarah, old, past your prime, do not scoff. God can make a desert bloom. Laugh for joy, love the child you will carry in your womb. For beyond any fortune you have guessed, through your faith many people will be blessed. Hagar, hold Ishmael, outcast child in the desert all alone. Love and life he will find, and a story of his own. For beyond any fortune you have guessed, through your faith many people will be blessed. Isaac, walk with your dad, carry wood ready for the sacrifice. Brushed by death, you will thrive. God was never throwing dice. For beyond any fortune you have guessed, through your faith many people will be blessed. Jesus, friends, by God's grace, Abram's head grafted in that ancient vine, live the peace. Spread the love, memorize in bread and wine. Far beyond any fortunes you have guessed, through your faith many people will be blessed. Three great faiths parting ways, hear one's voice calling out to Abraham, walk with me, love my word. I will show you who I am. Far beyond any fortune you have guessed, through your faith many people will be blessed. And as a people we have been blessed, and so we come now to give back to God. As you're able, let us give. Shall learn to love all 
creatures find their true accord, the hope of peace shall be fulfilled, for all the earth shall know. Will you pray with me? That God may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight as we seek to draw near to you and to hear from your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So did you know, you probably did, that one in every eight couples have trouble getting pregnant or sustaining pregnancy, which means 7.4 million women have received infertility services in their lifetime. A couple ages 29 to 33, much younger than Abraham and Sarah, with a normal functioning reproductive system has only a 20 to 25% chance of conceiving any given month. I know, you thought the sex talk was last week. But if we learn anything from the SAFE seminar, Sexual Awareness and Family Empowerment, is that we can't just have one talk, right? We have to talk about it over and over with our kids. We learned that last week. Just kidding, this is not the sex talk. but. Infertility treatment is actually very relevant to our passage of scripture for today. In this day and age, infertility treatment is pretty common. It's not unusual for women to take medication or to receive hormone injections in an effort to get pregnant. It's not unusual for couples to do in vitro fertilization or even embryo adoption incredibly now. All of this is to say that in our passage of scripture for today, Abraham and Sarah are dealing with infertility, and they have been for many, many, many years. You remember, way back in Genesis chapter 12, God speaks to Abraham and tells him that God is going to bless the whole world through his family. God makes these incredible promises. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. God is going to form a people for God's self from this family. There's only one little problem. They don't have any children. There are no heirs to become a great nation. There's a common method of fertility treatment in their day. It's available to them. Finally, Sarah decides that they have been waiting long enough and she has a plan. It's actually not a unique plan. It's a fairly common method of infertility treatment in their day. It is not considered morally reprehensible. She suggests a surrogate wife. She has just the woman in mind, Hagar, her Egyptian maid. It's a common practice in their culture. Now, we read it through our cultural lens and our sexual ethic, and we see this as immoral and awful. And if Michael tried to get a surrogate wife, you know, like off with the head. But the focus of this story in Scripture is not on the morality or the immorality of Abraham sleeping with Hagar. The emphasis is on the repercussions of their plan, which are disastrous for Sarah, for Abraham, and particularly for Hagar. Sarah says to Abraham, sleep with my maid. And scripture says, and Abraham listens to the voice of Sarah. Up to this point in the story, God has spoken to Abraham several times, and Abraham has listened to God, but now Abraham 
listens to the voice of Sarah. Maybe Sarah's voice is drowning out the voice of God. It's, it's insistent, and it's in his face. She wants a child now. They are tired of waiting. They doubt God's promise, and honestly, it is hard for me to blame them. They have waited so long. Perhaps Abraham and Sarah convince themselves that this is God's plan all along, a child through a surrogate. It's common in their day. So Abraham takes Hagar as his wife, and of course, as any couple who has dealt with infertility knows, immediately Hagar gets pregnant. Hooray! Cheer! Cheer! Yay! Hooray! There's going to be a baby. It's wonderful. Great news. This is exactly what Abraham and Sarah want, right? It's going to be great. No. When Hagar learns that she is pregnant, the Bible says she looks down on her mistress. Hagar's growing tummy broadcasts the success of Sarah's plan, but it does something else, too. It silently proclaims, I am a complete woman, Sarah, and you are not, at least by their cultural standards. Sarah's self-esteem plummets, and her misery becomes even greater than before. Her pent-up anger boils over into rage, and she is stuck in a mess of her own making. And you got to love the exchange between Abraham and Sarah. I laugh every time I read it. This is like typical old married couple, right? Sarah says, this is all your fault, Abraham, that I am suffering this abuse. I put my maid in your bed, and the minute she knows she's pregnant, she treats me like I am nothing. And with all the sensitivity of an aardvark or something, Abraham says, she's your slave girl. Do with her as you wish. Now, under normal circumstances, Abraham and Sarah's action seeking infertility treatment would have been acceptable in their culture, but their desire to help God keep God's promise and their lack of trust causes them to take matters into their own hands with disastrous results, particularly for Hagar. She is a pawn, a baby incubator, a slave girl, an object, not a person. And depending on your translation, it says Sarah deals harshly with her. She afflicts her. Did she beat her? Demean her? Did she pile so much work on the pregnant Hagar that she just couldn't take it anymore? Whatever Sarah does to Hagar, it's bad enough to force a pregnant woman to flee into the wilderness. She runs away. Can you feel her desperation? How bad would it have had to have been to run away into the desert as a pregnant woman? She's at the end of her rope. She's tired and thirsty and hungry. She is alone in the vast wilderness, and she has a baby kicking in her womb. She collapses by a spring, which is where an angel, an angel of the Lord finds her. An angel! That's what we need, an angel of the Lord. And then something incredible happens. Hagar gets connected with the Underground Railroad, and Harriet Tubman leads her to freedom. Well, that's what I want to happen. That's my dream, my hope, my wish for Hagar is that the angel would intervene and save her. She's been mistreated, and she deserves a better life. And the angel knows her situation well. Because the angel says to her, Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, what are you doing here? In other words, what's your plan? How is this going to work out for you? You need to rethink your situation. We expect, we want so badly a word of liberation. Instead, the angel says to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. 
The command seems harsh and uncaring. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat this story. I wish it did, but the Bible never pretends that life is easy, and it doesn't promise that God's people will always get what they want. Sometimes God doesn't offer us a way out, but a way through. And the promise that God will be with us along the way. Returning to Sarah will allow Hagar and her baby to survive. And as David and Diana Garland point out about this story, the reality is sometimes all God helps us do is survive. Divine intervention doesn't always deliver us from our troubles. Sometimes it just helps us get by. Hagar is out in the wilderness, and the vultures are circling overhead. She is alone with no provisions, no plan, and no help. Hagar has put her baby and her life at risk, and God does rescue her, just not in the way we want. And this encounter with the angel is an experience of grace for Hagar, just not in the way we want. How do we know that it's an experience of grace for Hagar? Because before Hagar goes back to Sarah, she gives God a name. Elroy, the God who sees. This is significant, incredible, because Hagar is the only person in Scripture to give God a name. This seemingly unimportant slave girl, this Nobody gives the God of the universe a nickname, the God who sees. Hagar gives God a name that describes a crucial part of God's nature as she experiences it. She has been an object, a baby incubator, a slave, invisible, a non-person, and God sees her. For Hagar, this divine attention is a miracle in and of itself. And she says, I have now seen the God who sees me. She is not invisible. God sees her. By the way, God sees you too. This story makes it clear that God sees. When we struggle to pay our bills. God sees. When we attempt to deal with cranky children in the middle of the night, God sees. When we're facing a life-threatening illness and we are afraid, God sees. When our family injures us, God sees. And when we feel like Hagar and we're tempted to flee our circumstances, God sees. Before Hagar goes back, to Sarah, God makes promises about the baby that she is carrying. And amazingly, did you notice? The promise that God makes to her is almost identical to the one that God made to Abraham. Hagar, the first single mom in the Bible, is going to have descendants too numerous to count. She's blessed, blessed by God. So in case you didn't notice, there is a lot of tension in this story. It's almost like the Bible is arguing with itself. As Pastor John Buchanan puts it, it's like God stands in judgment of the very religious tradition that God has inspired. What does he mean by that? The overarching narrative of Genesis and really the whole Bible beginning in Genesis 12 is Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's son who is to come. He is the child of the promise, the one that God is going to use to form a great nation, God's people. This is God's plan for the world. God is going to use Abraham and Sarah's descendants to bless the world and Jesus is going to come through them. So for Abraham and Sarah, Hagar is actually a temptation. She is a temptation not to trust in the promise. She is a threat to the promise. Yet, at the same time, God can't seem to dismiss her. Just because Hagar and her son Ishmael stand 
outside of the line, the promise. It doesn't mean that God will abandon them. God refuses to abandon them. From the very beginning, the Bible keeps reminding us that God doesn't forget those on the margins, those forgotten by the world. For all of humanity, there is nothing perhaps more devastating than feeling abandoned, forgotten, unwanted. Our earliest fear is of rejection. Our earliest and deepest human need is for acceptance and love. And the affirmation of this story is that God doesn't forget and God doesn't abandon anyone. When God came to earth in the person of Jesus, one of the many radical things that Jesus did was to sit down and eat with people who were considered the outcasts of society. Sinners, tax collectors, women, nobodies. People like Hagar, people like me, people like you. God sees us and God invites us to come and have a meal with him. God loves an open table. Amen.